And of course, um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm just going to jump right in here. So, because I want to stay with this idea of what are we going to do about all this stuff that's going on? And of course, the, the danger is that we'll just talk about it, right? And we'll just and we'll just sit around and talk about it, and we actually won't go out and engage it. And here's why we won't. Because as she said, we're afraid. We're afraid we won't know what to do. We're afraid it'll beat us, whatever it is. Um, yeah, that God can't actually overcome it. That's too late, all these, all these lies. And so it's through the pages of the scriptures we have all story after story after story of this problem happening. Civilization after civilization, and they fall. Because, because they fail. And they, they turn inward, they get divided, they get competitive within themselves, and they go to war against each other, and they fail, and they fall. What's, what is our hope? And here it is, we have, we have the book that talks about the way. The, the trouble is that it's, it's new in each generation. The answer is always the same. The way it applies, though, is fresh and new in each generation. and has to be searched out and thought about new by every generation. That's why generations can fail and lose, because they forget. Or the generation ahead of them doesn't teach them. So in Gideon's day, you know, as we're going through this, it's a terrible time for Israel because they they didn't want God to be their advisor. They wanted a king, their own military. That's what happened. It's too much trouble to depend on God to raise up farmers and peaceful people to fight their enemies. And then when they're done, disband and go back to farming. That's too much trouble. We need a standing, very powerful army to protect us. Not God. He's too slow. He, he has crazy plans. They're, we don't like them. They're uncomfortable. So, they fall apart. Different strategies of the enemy at different times in different parts of our culture, identities inside of our culture, attacked. Reconciliation, reconciliation breaks down. We give up. And so, what's the process back? The process back is always the same. It's not steps to be repeated. It's a process to be involved in all the time, every day. It's not for grand movements at one time. It's every day, every day, that works out into grand movements. So in Judges, in Gideon's day, we see this process begin. The people are in a situation. They actually don't know who the enemy is. They're fighting against enemies that are not their enemies, and they're losing. And so they just come up with a survival strategy, which is just let's, let's divide into our own little enclaves and protect our own little enclaves of our team, whoever that is, from the other teams. And actually the tribes of Israel are divided out, and they, they won't work together. So there's a huge division. And so the Lord comes in to move, as he always does, beginning with one person. Now we can't ever quite get this in this line. It works with one person, one at a time, one, one, one. Like this, not masses of people gathering in certain locations. Because all this, that massive crowd just goes home. No, no, that one may be that. But I'm going back to my little cave with my little wine press. I did, I showed up and that was enough. And so, they finally, though, in desperation, cry out to God, and this is what they say, we actually do not know what to do. We're tired of slogans, cliches, we're tired of it, we actually don't know what to do. Will you help us? And God always says, yes, 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 finally you call out to me. And we ask him, will you just tell us the truth of what is happening that's the first step. And so the truth tellers come. And the truth tellers come, the prophet, 
the truth tellers in our culture. We're talking about them today. Who, who, how do we speak truth every day? And, and the truth doesn't come in what I say to you first. It comes in how I speak to God. Do I speak truth here? Because this is where it breaks down. Not out here. It breaks down right here. And I'm actually living in deception right here. My prayer life is a deception. It's not true. It's false. And so the truth teller comes and says, your real enemy is not here. It's not here. It's here. And it's not a person. It's the fear of evil. The gods of the Amorites. It's the fear of that, of witchcraft and sorcery and dark arts and things that you don't think God is stronger than that. And you're understanding God actually isn't. Because we keep losing. And so the prophet comes and tells that truth so that people know who the actual enemy is. Oh, that's the enemy? Yes. So what do we do now that we know who the enemy is? Now, we need an identity to go fight the real enemy. You cannot fight an enemy if you have no identity. Who are you fighting for on behalf of what? So, the next part is, so the prophet comes and tells the truth about the situation. They're social critics, they're prophets, and they come and they tell the truth, and then God begins to raise up the identities to go to battle. And the person that gives identity is Jesus. And so Gideon, the angel of the Lord, comes. And he starts to show up to people one at a time, to give them and draw them back into the identity that they were given at birth, that they've lost track of or given away or whatever. And so Jesus shows up with Gideon and calls him by his actual identity. Mighty man of valor. Mighty man of valor. And so we're thinking, if we can watch it here, if we can read it here, why can't we live it out? So we're asking God, if this word is true, that I would love to see Jesus show up and give me identity because no man can come to the Father except through Christ. You can't access your identity without meeting Jesus. This right gets in the Old Testament even before it gets more clear in the New do you understand that? So for those of us that are struggling, like I, I don't even know what it means to ask God what he says because I've never met Jesus. See, that's the first part. Okay, I know the truth. The truth is I can't save myself. The truth is no matter how much we get together and meet and have committee and make plans and signs and protest and argue, we can't save ourselves. We, we need God. God come to us, and he does. And when he comes to us, it's always Jesus. Always. Cry out to God, Jesus shows up, I'm sorry. It's so beautiful when I'm, when, when I'm with my Muslim friends, and we're in these very dark, complicated, militant generations of hatred places, and it's just us, me and one other person, or me and Donna, we don't have to have 5,000 people there, it's just us, because do you understand that when you walk into the room, the entire kingdom of God walks in the room with you? Do you not know that? Do you think you need a million people? You don't. When you walk into a room, the kingdom of God has arrived, because do you not know that you are the temple of the living God? Do you not know that? We must not. We must not. Because we're afraid. I need more people. <laughs> and so we're in this place, and, and the person's like, I don't get it. I, I, you know, I've learned my whole life that the Prophet Muhammad is the right, and Jesus is not important, and, and how do I know? And we say, well, let's just ask Jesus to show up, because he's really good at this. He has a tendency to show up in places. And so, and when we ask him, he comes. So, just we lay our hands on our Muslim friends who say, yeah, let's figure out the truth. There's the first sign. 
Let's figure out the truth. We lay our hands on God. My friend here doesn't know Christ. He's never seen him, never met him. Doesn't understand it. Have mercy. In your kindness, will you change the way he thinks? Will you show him? Will you show him, Jesus? Or will you come? And do you know how many times, let me ask this, do you know how many times Jesus has shown up when we do that? Every time. Every single time. Do you know why? Because he loves us a lot. It's not complicated. Why do we make it so They already have that God. <laughs> no, he shows up. And so Jesus comes to Gideon and calls him by his real name. And he's like, do you want to actually live like your true identity? Do you like this false one so far? Do you want to live in your true identity? Walk with me and live in it. Yeah, but Jesus, you don't understand. You don't. And he's like, do you want to live in your true identity or not? Then come with me. And Gideon is like, who is this? Like, who is this? So he does what I would do if Jesus showed up. Like, can I get you something to eat? <laughs> Wouldn't you do that? No, but that's their culture. And so he's like, I, can, I, I, can I offer you something? Because he's not sure who this is. Who talks to me like this? Who is this? Remember the, remember the man at the well in the New Testament? And Jesus walks up to him and says, do you want to get well? Or are you like laying here for 38 years, hoping an angel shows up? How do you like that strategy? Is it working? Because if you're satisfied with it, I'll move on. But if you want to get well, look at me. Look, look at, don't look at the pool. Look at me. Look at me. Are you looking? And the guy's like, I do want to get well, but my problem is this. I can't get down there by myself. I can't save myself. Jesus is like, beautiful. That's true. Exactly right. Yeah, and what else? And even if I could, other people cut me off. They don't care. It's like they care more about themselves. So here's one of the truth I've come to. I can't save myself, and no one else can save me. Jesus is like, beautiful. You're right there. Look at me. Look at me. You can't save yourself. No one can save you. I can. Look, stand up. Stand up here. Stand up. And he stands up. He's like, hey, yeah. He's jumping around. And Jesus leads. <laughs> I want to be there, like, did you see what I just, did you, anybody see what I just did? I'm starting a seminar on how to do this. <laughs> so I can speak in venues where they don't beat each other with fish before I <laughs> Do you see what Jesus did? And that is the same thing he's doing with Gideon. It's the same thing. Every generation, all cultures, all times, it's the same process. And the Pharisees, you know, they're like, do you see that guy walking? Yeah, he's walking. I know, what day is it? Is it the Sabbath? He shouldn't be walking. He shouldn't be walking today. I, I, I was crippled and I'm walking. If you would have been walking yesterday, that would have been fine. We don't say We reject this. By the way, who made you what? I don't know, some guy. That's his answer. I don't know, some guy. There he is, that's that guy right there. He's the one. It didn't take this deep. Did you believe that Jesus was God when you met him? <laughs> did you understand the hypostatic union of God and man? Because if you did, I'm not sure you're a real believer. And I'll decide if you are or not. And what day is it? It's the wrong day for you to believe. And we reject the transformation that Wow. Why? God, what do you call me? I call you a mighty warrior. Ah, I don't agree with that. <laughs> I love Howard way more. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I said this to that. I with people. I'm like, do you want to know the name that God calls you? Yeah. Well, well, let's do it. Ready? God, what do you call this person? And this is what the person does. They're doing this in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you shaking your head at? <laughs> Jesus is talking to you, and here's your response. <laughs> he doesn't speak. What? I don't know. 
have some dumb thing like I'm more than a conqueror. I don't know, but it's not true. It's not mm. God doesn't speak. You have to receive him. Receive him. Receive him. Receive him. When Jesus says something to you, here's the, here's the super complicated way you have to respond to whenever he says something to you. Yes. <laughs> don't say this. I don't really get Just don't say that. Say this. Yes, 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 yes. And he'll teach you all along as you go with yes. If you start with no, it tends to stop right there. <laughs> I know this is complicated. It's not really that hard. So you say yes, it goes. You say no, it stops. Why do you say no? Why do you say no? We're afraid. So Jesus comes on the scene, and he tells Gideon his real identity. And then here's why Gideon must know his real identity, and he learns it from Jesus, is because if Gideon doesn't know his real identity, he can't, listen carefully, he cannot hear God. That's the process here. If Jesus doesn't come and interact with us and walk us into the kingdom, we cannot hear God. So Jesus comes and Gideon's like, can I make you something? Because I want to figure out who this person is. And it's an angel, he probably won't eat. This is like, he, remember, he's an Easterner, so he's thinking of this in his own context. So he goes, wait for it. Jesus is like, yeah, go, no, wait for you. And Jesus is so patient, I love him. He's so beautiful. Yeah, we're pretty go out of town. And so Gideon makes this thing, and then, then Jesus burns it up. Look at that up. I'm like, Phew. That. You know what that means to Gideon? That this is the Son of Man. Because he didn't, he conceived the sacrifice went up in fire. It's in the flame of God. And Gideon's like, and then Jesus, I love, it's like, this is better than Harry Potter. <laughs> it goes like this, and then he vanishes. Jesus has done his job. Brought him into his true identity. <clears throat> he, he consumes the sacrifice and he vanishes. And look at the next thing that happens. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Wow. It's like Jesus is saying, It is finished. You now have direct access. You now are the temple of the living God. You. He vanishes, and Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, oh Lord God. Because Jesus said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Alas, oh Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And then you know who talks to him next? Yahweh. But the Lord said, who is that? Oh my gosh, I'm in the throne itself. Before the king, I'm getting suddenly to hear God. That's incredible. This is salvation. This is what happens tonight if you, if you don't know Jesus and you say, Jesus, come to me, come to me. And he shows up and he walks you into your true identity through his death and resurrection and he walks you in and he's gone and you are in the throne room of God himself free to talk and listen that's what happens right here but the Lord said to him here's the very first thing the Lord Almighty says to Gideon what is it? peace to you peace, peace you know why? Because Gideon's going to go out to make peace in his land, but here's why he can't. He doesn't have peace here. You can't do it. You can talk about it all day long. You cannot become, you cannot do what you do not possess. You can talk about it, write about it, sing about it. You cannot give away what you do not have. You do not have peace. How can you bring peace out here? There's a war right here. I do not like that person. I do not want to share the kingdom with them. I have no peace here. I have no peace there. God breathes the peace. Peace. Peace be to you. Do not, what? Fear. Peace. Do not fear. The number one exhortation in scripture, do not be afraid. 
do not be afraid because it's our number one blocker killer is fear. Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Isn't that what we're all afraid of? I might die. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. Peace is not an action. Peace is not a condition. Peace is a person. The Lord is peace. If you're trying to have peace without the Lord, you will not have it. The Lord is peace. If you want peace, the Lord has to be here. If you want peace, the Lord has to be here. Peace is a person. He's a prince. He's the prince of peace. He's Emmanuel, God. sudden Gideon can hear God and God talks a lot. He wasn't, he, Gideon in his false identity in his little cave, in his little scared little cave, he doesn't hear God. Jesus shows up, here's your true identity. Suddenly, it's like God talks all the time. That night, the Lord said to him, to Gideon, ready? So Gideon has an identity from Christ. Now he's interacting directly with God. Here's what God is always going to don't be afraid, we're going to have peace here. Now, ready? Here's what we're going to do together to bring peace to this whole place. That night the Lord said to him, take your father's pole and the second pole, seven years old, pull down the altar of Baal. We've got to tear down the altars because when God shows up their seeds, there will be no other gods here. That is his demand. And his condition is that when Jesus walks you into the kingdom, here's your identity. I've died and risen again to bring you into your true identity. When you step into the throne room of God, you will have no other gods in there. The altars that are in your life will now be torn down. You cannot tear down the idols in your life if you have no identity in the kingdom. Because you're, you don't know what you're, why would I tear down altars? For what? I don't have an identity. But I'm a mighty man of valor. Wow, how do I do that? Now I know I'm supposed to be living like this. What? A, a mighty man of valor lives or whatever God calls you. So what does that mean? Now I have an identity that wants a destiny. I want a destiny. What's the obstacle to my destiny? Other gods. <laughs> The fear of the gods of the Amorites are killing you. It's the altar. Where is the altar? Where is the altar? Right in your own house. Where are the gods of the Amorites? Where are they? In your house. Your house. Why are you looking out here? Why are you looking over there? They're in your house. With who? With your father. With your family. You. No way I don't have any altars in my house. <laughs> They do. They're the pagans out there. Where's the altar? Right there. Tear it down. How can I tear it down? Because you have an identity move and the strength that you have. Tear it down now. Tear it down. My question tonight is, what are the altars in this house in you right now? You're not going anywhere with those altars. They need to be torn down now because this is the fear of the gods of the Amorites right here. And you are crippled by them, even in your identity. Oh, I've got an identity from God. Then let's go take the city. Well, I'm going to work on my identity at home tonight. No, let's go. No, no, no. Let's go bring peace to the city. Well, I need to study more about identity. Do you see? That's the trap. Don't stop. You have an identity. Let's go. Tear them down. Ready? Where are they? In your own heart. Let's go. Here we go. And so God gives them the instruction. Cut it down, the ash pole that is beside it, and build an altar for the Lord here. I will have no other gods before me. I want an altar to me right here forever. On top of the stronghold of fear that used to be there. It's an exchange. Jesus dies on the cross. He takes all of your garbage and fear and mind and your shame and guilt upon himself. 
and on the place of that old stronghold, he puts his righteousness and a throne room where God himself comes to dwell in place of the fear, in place of the stronghold. And do you not know that you are the temple of the living God? Now go in peace. That's what's happening here. Then take the second bowl and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah. I love how he's taking the stronghold, tearing them down, and using it as fuel for the new life that God runs. So Gideon took... It's not Gideon by himself anymore. Suddenly, what happens? There's ten other men involved. Where did they come from? What happened? Suddenly, other Gideon is drawing other people into the tearing down of the altar. How did that happen? It's like a movement. I didn't see God say, start a movement. I, I see him telling Gideon, move in your own identity, tear down the altars in your house, and somehow other people have already started moving into it. How is that happening? This is what happens. This is organic. And so, so Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had told him, but because he was too afraid, but not too afraid, just a little afraid, he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, God's like, okay. Can I do it at night? All right. Yeah, it would be awesome if you did it all day, but you're doing it. It's all right. It's okay. Jesus, Jesus, there's 5,000 people out here, and they're hungry. And so we've been thinking about this. We got together. We thought about it. What can we do with 5,000 hungry people? And we decided we're going to send them away. That's our strategy. Send them away. And Jesus is like, Okay, here's my strategy, you feed them. Okay, we thought you might say something like that, so we've thought about that, and we can't. We don't have the money to do this. We need to take something crazy like that. So, our strategy is, we can't do it, we're gonna send them away. Jesus is like, huh, I knew you would say that. So, can you do this? Can you sit them down in groups? We can do that, okay, all right, let's do that. Let's do that. Jesus doesn't mind. God will want to work with you as long as you're moving forward with him. He loves you. It's okay. Come on. Tear it down! Right now! Can we do it at night? Sure. Alright, whatever. Beautiful. He's so kind. But you are going to tear it down. My friend. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down. And the Asher pole beside it was cut down, and the second pole was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? <laughs> and after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, Joash has done this thing. Hmm. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring your son out that he may die. <laughs> Not the reaction probably that Gideon thought. I told you this is about the shepherd that night. And that didn't even work. That he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asher beside it. But Joash said to all who stood there, the father, he says, wait a second, wait, 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 wait a minute now. Okay, the pole, it's all been destroyed for like six hours. And nothing has happened. Huh. Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself. Wow, we're not that afraid of the gods of the Amorites. So I don't know. Let's see what, if they can really contend like we used to think they can. Like we were always been afraid of them doing this. But now that we've kind of stepped into it, and it's funny because they didn't do it. They're moving because Gideon mighty men about to did it. But now even more people have moved in. Now wait a second, let's not kill Gideon yet. Like where are the gods of the Amorites? There are they even really there? If he is God, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubbabel, that is to say, let Baal contend against them because he broke down the fear of the gods of the Amorites. How long did it take him to do it? One day. For seven years of fear and destruction in his country. One day. How many people? One guy plus ten. And now his dad's on the team. And now more people are on the team. Hmm. It wasn't 10 million people. It was 15, but one started it. 
Here's my question tonight. Right now, what would happen if in my true identity in the kingdom of God with Jesus, I say to the Father, you say, you tell me, what are the idols in my life? What are the strong? What are the altars? I mean, you search me and you tell me what they are. Don't tell me what they are. Don't defend them. What are they? We're going to do that in just a second. What happens if you do that and he tells you what they are? And you pull them down and give them to him? What could happen with you if that fear gone? What could you do? You don't even know what you could do. You have no idea what you could do. Say you know what you could ask for money. No, I don't know fear here. Don't be afraid, you're not gonna die. What would you do if you were so unafraid and you weren't afraid of dying? You had no fear of other gods, and you knew your identity. What would you do? So we decided, well, let's, let's try this. Let's see if this works. So in Indonesia, we took a group of 12th graders. Why not? It doesn't matter. 12th graders, and our, the 12th graders were my literature class, and they were Buddhist and Hindu and Muslim and European secular atheists and some Christians. And that was the group of them in the whole class. 20 or so of them. And so we spent a semester teaching identity as, as literature, actually. Reading about identity and literature and studying identity and reading the Bible as literature studying on identity. And then my question for the class was, who are you? Who are you? And it, it was, because they started then, well, I'm Buddhist, well, I'm Hindu, well, I'm Muslim, well, I'm French, or I'm whatever. And I, no, 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 that's a cultural identity, that's an ethnic identity. No, 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 no. Stop classifying each other by cultural and ethnic identities by said, Who are you? Who are you? You. And they really got into it. And then I said, here's a question. Let's do this. Let's ask whoever you think is up there. So for the Muslims, you know, Allah, the Buddhist, whoever, and the Hindu, everybody, and the French, <laughs> ask your neighbor, and whatever. <laughs> but let's start asking out here. Are you willing to do that? Why not? We're students, we don't care, let's try. <laughs> and so what happened? So we started doing this. Okay, let's just take a minute in the class, let's just think. Whoever, whatever's out there, who am I? And they love it. Who am I? <laughs> the problem is, there's a person out there that answers. But see, but see, because I'm a believer, the room is in the kingdom of God. And so only one voice is allowed in there. Because you own the room. Amen. You own that. And so I thought, oh, what do I call it? Okay, you mind can't do it. Okay, ready? Ask. And they started asking. And it's like this, this like this wind. It's so fascinating. It's cool. What is that? And this one person starts to cry. I don't know. I've always wanted to be a singer. Really? Why? Well, and it, and it, and it, and then other people are like, you know what I've always wanted to be is that was that them or God? Yes. Is that what they want or God want? Yes. It is. And they start moving in it, and we kept working on it and working on it. And here's what happens when this happens. They began to focus in on their identity, and of course, they began to meet Jesus one by one. He started showing up. So amazing. The Hindus saw him first because they see everyone. Hindus <laughs> <laughs> over there, there's 50. And then they started to come to faith. It's, Donna can tell you about this. It was one of the most remarkable years we have ever seen in a world. And it started to sweep through them. And then out into other grades and all. But here's what happened. So as they heard their identity, they began to pull down altars, not only inside their hearts, actually at their houses. At night. I suggest it at night. <laughs> I suggest people go, you can do it at night. <laughs> they started to take down altars in all different ways. Very, very fascinating. The, one of the French girls who just a hardcore atheist 
came to faith and she said to me, I want to have an assembly. This is just one example. I want to have an assembly where we bring all the students in and invite all the parents and I would like to speak. And I said, what would you like to say? She said, I would like to stand up in front of my father and tell him how Christ has come into my life. I'm like, who, who told you to do that? Who suggested that? He, I can hear him. And we did it. And her father said, and her mother sat back there like, what has happened? She led both her parents to faith. They're great friends of ours today. She did. Led her parents to Christ. So what happened was, so once, once they started tearing down altars, then the Lord could start bringing them into what he wanted to do in the city. Because they were fearless now, and there was no other. And they knew how to move in their identity. So I'll say this quickly. I wish I could tell you this whole beautiful thing. But so yeah, here's the thing. Yeah, here's the thing about the Bible. Let me just say this about the Bible. It's true. Amen. This happens. When you're telling the truth, when Jesus is involved giving identity and leading you into the kingdom, and you have direct access to God Himself, then God can start handing you territory. Because you can take it. And so this is going on. And so then we decided, let's do a retreat with these seniors in Jakarta. With other seniors. And just let them go out among them and see what happens. Don't tell them what to do. Just say, let's just ask the Lord. Each one of you ask the Lord. You're Hindu. You're Muslim. You're French. You're whatever you are. And so we're going to have students from all over the world at this retreat. Go find your people. And tell them what's happened to you. We did, we did like the, the divanya. Go tell them the great things God's done in your life and the mercy he's shown. Just tell them in any way that God helps you, tell them. Do it. And so we had the retreat, and they did it. And it was stunning. Stunning. I didn't have to tell them what to do. They, they somehow knew without me telling them. And it was better than what I would have told them. And so that happens, and it causes this impact in Jakarta. So we're in a Muslim country doing this. And so the students in Jakarta go out on their thing, and we go back to our city. And three of the students in Jakarta are praying, and they say, you know what the stronghold in Jakarta is? It's this one particular nightclub that all young people go to. Muslim, everyone goes to this nightclub because of these musicians in there that are so incredibly famous. Let's go take These are high school kids. Fortunately, there's no laws in Indonesia that would prevent them from doing it. And so they go and they win to Christ the famous musicians. And so they call, they call us, guess what? You know the famous musicians in that famous nightclub right in the center of Jakarta? Yeah, they're Muslim, they're Muslim guys. They come to Christ. They have power. I don't want to try and explain it to you. It just happened. So here's what the musicians <laughs> suggested. The musicians suggested on our busiest night, Saturday night, it's a mass, it's a three-story club. The musicians want you guys to come in and spread out through the whole club and get and want they'll do a set, they'll give their testimonies, and someone stand up and speak and share the gospel, and we'll just see what happens in the night. But we can't control the environment. It's going to be insane. They serve tons of alcohol. We can't control anything about the environment in there. We're just trusting that whoever gets up to speak can silence three stories of drunk people to share with us. <laughs> so we just need a person willing to do that. And they said, who taught you guys about identity? Get that person. So they come and say, Jamie... Have you ever spoken in a drunk nightclub? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, spoken in or just been in one? Which is what you And so they tell me this scenario. Now let me ask you a question. So why would I say no to that? I've never done anything like that in my life. Why would I say no to it? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of how I would look. This altar 
of myself would stop me from doing something like that. But it's that altar is not there. And I know my identity. And I know I know what to do in a place like this. I just don't know exactly how to do it. But I figure that when I get there, I will know. So we arrange it. And so on Friday night, we go in there early before it gets crazy. Donna's with and the students, and we go in there and we spread out. And so here's our brilliant strategy. <laughs> the musician guys draw the crowd. They're going to sing. They're going to give a quick thing as Muslims, how they've come to faith in Jesus, but they have to be really careful so we don't have a riot on how they do it. And then one of our music guys with us is going to come up and sing a song to kind of transition. Not as well as we transition here, but we're going to try and transition. <laughs> And, um, and then I'm supposed to get up and start talking about the gospel. And the owner of the club is like, I'm only going to do this because these guys are so famous and I, I'll do it for them. But, but I'm, we can't, we're not going to stop serving people. We're not going to make an announcement. You just got to start talking. And if they listen, fine. If they don't, we're sorry. So that's what happens. So we start, and it is crazy in this place. And the musicians are playing, and everyone loves them. Three floors, there's, there's big screen TVs on the different levels. And we're on the middle floor with the stage. They're singing, they finish, they, and they start talking about, hey, something's happened in our life. It's really incredible. Now they're Muslims. So they say it in a way that's really fascinating, but the club is filled with all nationalities. American expats, Europeans, Muslims, Hindu, everyone's in there. What's fascinating is our student body is all of those. We are everywhere in that place. In that group. And so they give their talk, and our guy comes up, plays a song, and then I come up, and it's bedlam. I mean, as soon as the magicians sit down, everyone sits down, it just goes crazy, and the waitresses and the waiters are serving, and it's loud, and I come up on the stage, and I'm standing right at the front of the stage, and right in front of me, are these three Australian guys who have been there since probably noon. It's 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> and, uh, and it shows that they've been there a long time. And they have no idea what's happening. <laughs> they're, just, <laughs> they're just staring up like... <laughs> and, and, it's, and, they, and, so, and it's just crazy like this. So I stand up there the whole time I'm praying, God... I need to know what to say right now, right now, right now. <laughs> like, even when I get up there, I look at these guys, and they're just like... <laughs> and one of them goes, who's this guy? <laughs> and the other guys go, were they talking about Jesus? Is that what happened? What happened? Who's this guy? Like this? And I'm like, great. This is who's right in front of me. And then the rest is just going like this. And so the Lord says, says, scare. That's what he says to me, scare them. And I'm like, okay. Like, what? How? You know, like, what? How do I scare them? Scare them? And the Lord's like, tell them, tell them about the case you worked with the demonic guy. And I'm like, it was like a little conversation between, I'm like, that is such a good idea. These guys don't know what's going on. They have lots of time. Like, they're like, what's he doing? <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> Who's he talking to? And, uh, and, uh, and so I so I tell this story. I'll tell you sometime the story I tell. But it's this brutal demonic homicide story that we were. And so I just start telling it. And, and I just go into all the details of it. And especially the Indonesians just stop moving. <laughs> And, like, and so then, after he cut them up, and people are just like, and the Australians are like, what is he talking about? <laughs> is he talking about demons? <laughs> Did he say demons? And they're asking each other. And I tell this whole story, and I can see Donna standing in the back at the exit, talking to this Asian woman, like they're in this deep conversation. So I can tell Donna's already moving with the story, but it gets quieter and quieter, and the waiters and waiters stop to hear the story, and they're like, what the, what happened? Like, and I'm telling it, and all of our students have never heard the story either, they're all looking at me like, what happened? You know, like this. And see, you know what the Lord's doing? He's using my identity. Do you see that? He's asking me only to speak in my own identity about what I know, and I know this stuff. 
He didn't ask me to preach the gospel. He didn't ask me to, he, he said, do what you wanted to do since you were in eighth grade, be a cop right in front of him. Do it. Do you see that? I was totally comfortable and I'm so beautiful. I knew what to do. And so I'm telling this story, and this is the end of my story. I feel like this. So tonight, this is what happens when you walk out that door tonight. Outside, in those streets tonight, are demons. <laughs> I kill people, just like in the story. <laughs> Your only option is you better know Jesus. He's the only one that can protect you. And I just went and sat down. And no one knows what to do. It's like, no one's going to leave. <laughs> So then the Muslim guys come back on and they start playing. You know? <laughs> and we're and like my students are like, did, did that work? <laughs> did anything happen? And so, but so what they did was they went around and they started asking people that were they afraid that this story may become fearful? Because they were experts in overcoming fear. Right? And that's, and they spread out, and I, I, I watched Donna leave with the, the woman that she was with, who was a Chinese architect, worked for an architectural firm, and Donna went right outside with her, and the lady invited Christ into her life because of her fear of darkness in the world. So, that, and so we just worked the crowd all night long like that. I was so proud of the students in an international Muslim city, and they could just do it. Fearless. The next day, so that was Saturday night, the, the next morning, the big international church in Jakarta, the guy calls me, he goes, hey, I heard you guys have a crazy time at that club. Would you come speak at our church this morning? And I said, yeah, I guess. And so I go into the church, and you know, and I go up to I go up to the front to speak, and right in the front row, <laughs> and their wives, <laughs> and I can, I know they don't remember me, but they're looking at me like. <laughs> And so I speak, you know, in the church. And when I'm done, the, they come, the Australian guys and their wives come to me, and the, and the wives come up to me and go, were you in a bar last night telling a story about cannibalistic demons? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> and the guys are like, we told you. <laughs> we thought we were drunk. We, we were, but we still know the story. <laughs> And, it, and their wives, and they were so scared when they came home that they said, we're going to church. <laughs> we're going to church tomorrow. And we go. <laughs> and those men came to Christ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can do this stuff all the time. You know why we can't do it? You know why God can't walk us in those places and say, take it? Because we don't know our identity. Because we have altars here that scare us and stop us. I'm saying, let's know our identity and let's tear them down. So let's take a second right now. Ready? Let's take a second. This is not, it doesn't take long. It's just quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, in this room right now, we silence him. In the name of Christ, our King, we silence him. We confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that he is the incarnate one come in the flesh. And he rules here. And he walked the earth, and he was crucified and buried, and rose again the third day. And when he burst forth up and out of death, the victory over death, never be afraid of death again, he burst forth. Because the grave couldn't hold him, and Satan couldn't hold him, he was the victor, the overcomer, and he made a mockery of the end. And he came up and out and he set the captives free and he walked around for 40 days and he talked about the kingdom. And then he ascended where he sits at your right hand in glory of God. And he's the name of all names. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But at the name of Jesus, 
Every knee will bow, every demon, every Muslim, every Christian, every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, and there is no contest, there is no competition, they will bow, and so we bow. You are Lord. And Jesus is a high priest that was tempted in every way, just like we are yet without sin. He, he didn't lose his identity, he didn't fall short of the glory of God, he walked it out with perfection, and because he did, his death opened the way directly into the throne room of God. You yourself. And we can come boldly, not because we want to, because you want us to come. You're saying, come to me in my throne room in time of need boldly, because it's not by your works that you're coming. It's by faith and grace. It's a gift. No one can brag about this. Take it. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. In that throne room where you speak our identity, here's our question right now before you, O oh Lord. In the fullness of your spirit, rushing through every part of our mind and body in truth, with no deception present, God, what are the idols and the altars in my heart right now? Name them. Name them in the name of Jesus. What are they? Listen. Listen to them. What are they, Lord? What are they? And as the Lord speaks those to you, rip them out. Hand them to him. Here it is, God. Here they are. Here they are. He names them. Hand them to him. God, I'm afraid of this. God, I'm more interested in how I look to people than what you want. God, I'm more interested in money than you. God, whatever those I know are, rip them out, tear them down, cut them down, and give them to Jesus. He died to take them away. Let them have them. This is confession. God, we give you these idols, we give you these altars, these places that are so strong and deep in us, we can't break them. Break them. In the name of Jesus, the fullness of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Break them. And Lord, as you tear them down, what do you build in their place? We receive from you what you build in place of those altars in me. Build in me love, joy, and peace, and patience, and goodness, and kindness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. Make me fear less. Make me fear less so I'm not a talker. I'm a doer. The word becomes flesh and lives out through me into the world. And when you say, let's take the bar, we can take the bar. And when you say, let's take the violence, we can take it. And when you say, crush the enemy, we can. 